now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, the trade deadline's over. It looked like it was going to be the great Simone Fontecchio trade deadline of 2024. And then actually a lot of stuff happened and a lot of stuff didn't happen, particularly at the top of the West or also the top of the media coverage spotlight in the West. Um, And we will get to as much of it as we can. We're loopy. These are snap reactions. Everybody's tired. We haven't had time to make all the calls we want to make and dot all the I's and cross all the T's. We're flying by the seat of our pants. I have not even had my annual one beer yet. Bobby Marks, how are you? I'm good. I'm doing good. Yeah. I mean, we went, um, it's fun. We, we, you know, Woj and I were doing pods, uh, at night, like late at night. And we were, you know, we got to the point where like, are we going to have anything else to talk about here? We were like, we're scraping for, for stuff to talk about. And yeah, we, we, um, we had a kind of a, a little bit of a flurry on, uh, on Thursday morning. And then we had a bunch of stuff during the day. And, and as you said, you know, certainly some things that, 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 uh, that did not happen, but all in all, I mean, kind of one of those, I don't want to say typical trade deadlines because it, this year was a little bit different because two of the bigger names were off the board when we got to the deadline with three, OG. three. Yeah. Of the bigger oh names. yeah. Three. Yeah. Oh, with OG and, and, um, and Pascal Siakam. And then you could throw James Harden back in, you know, back in, uh, I guess November, early November. Um, so it, you know, what you talk, when you talk to teams, they're saying, yeah, it's going to be a lot about guys and that, you know, the seventh man to 11th man. And certainly, um, New York didn't see that way. <laughs> a, a lot of action in the East. Lakers, nothing. Clippers, nothing. Already did the James Harden trade into Daniel Tyson move and all that. Denver, oh, you guys, you guys think we got to do something with our young bench? Come deal with our two-man game in mile-high air in the playoffs. Pelicans had a lot of stuff to trade, nothing. Mavericks will talk about Mavericks active. Woo, baby, Mavericks. They went to the bank. As... Sam, they went to the bank of Sam Preston. We'll talk about that. <laughs> oh my God. The interest the, the interest rates are, are oh my just goodness. abusive. <laughs> uh, the Jazz all over the Warriors, another media darling. Nothing. Well, we're going to talk about my thunder. Yeah, baby. Minnesota addressed its backup point guard needs. And by the way, their offense just keeps on falling apart in crunch time. The latest was a Horrible loss in Chicago the other night. But we must start, Bobby Marks. We must start. Oh, and we must start. I was going to say the Lakers did nothing. I already said that. My brain is mush. The New York Knickerbockers of New York City, the greatest city in the world. I don't really know what's happened, Bobby. I don't understand. It just, it happened so slowly. It was like imperceptible. And the Knicks are suddenly acting like the smartest franchise in the NBA after 20 years of like Homer Simpson looking at every shiny object that passes by the, Ooh, a blue car and chasing the blue car. The Knicks just assiduously thoroughly gathering little assets, little nuts, like a squirrel, little acorns of draft picks and this and that. And almost imperceptibly just bit by bit by bit have gone from you know, a a 21 win team and a 17 win team before Randall got there to the playoff disappointment of two seasons ago before Jalen Brunson got there. And they today acquire Boyan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks from the Detroit Pistons who are doing God knows what. And if you look at the sort of aggregate trade that they have made this year, including the Ananobi deal, outgoing RJ Barrett, Quentin Grimes today, Emmanuel Quickly, Evan Fournier, Malachi Flynn, Ryan Archie Diacono, a good Detroit second round pick, two more seconds that went out today, incoming Ananobi, Bogdanovich, Burks, Achua. The Knicks are now loaded with good players. Their starting five will be once healthy, and we'll talk about Ananobi in a second. Brunson, DiVincenzo, who can't miss a three and certainly won't stop taking them. And an Obi who's going to have surgery on his elbow. He'll be out at least three weeks. Better now with the All-Star break coming up than pretty much any time. You can get by that. Randall, maybe Mitchell Robinson, maybe Isaiah Hartenstein. And then the first four guys off the bench are Josh Hart, Boyan Bogdanovich, Alec Burks, and either Hartenstein or Achua or Jericho Sims or whoever. Like You don't even have to get to Deuce McBride. That's guy number 10 or 11. Just loaded, and they have size on the wing and shooting on the wing. Both Bogdanovich, they can do a lot of interesting things lineup-wise. And you look at what went out and what went in, and what's striking to me is, A, 
we never said the word first. They got all their firsts. All the firsts are still here. So they're all still set up to trade for whatever superstar becomes available down the line. And the whole league has noticed, oh, the Knicks, the Knicks got religion. The Knicks are smart now. And it's just interesting, Bobby, to zoom out and think, you know, there was a celebration a year and change ago when R.J. Barrett signed his extension. The first New York Knicks first round pick to do so since Charlie Ward, who was a football player as well. People may recall from the grainy low def footage of Florida State football in the 90s. And there was a lot of pride within the Knicks about this quartet of first round picks. Barrett, Grimes, Quickly, and Obi Toppin. All of them are gone. And I, and yet it's a tribute to the Knicks that none of it feels wasteful. None of it feels like they've thrown these guys away to get a team that's too old or too ancient or too anything. It's just a good, solid team. And if if they get in and it'll be healthy, you, we can sit here and talk about, well, they don't have a top 10 player. They don't have a top five player. They don't have this. They're not going to have the best player in any playoff series. You look, I've said all year we could wake up and the Knicks could be in the conference finals. I think we need to upgrade that and be like, we can wake up and the Knicks could be in the finals. Like, this is a home run trade deadline for the Knicks, and I don't even know what to do with that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When we when we started hearing about Detroit, the thinking was, well, are the Pistons going to ask for that first back that New York has of Detroit? And they didn't. And Or maybe they've asked. You know, I haven't, as you said, we, we're still in the process of making calls, and you get two, two seconds here, and you still have eight first available to use um when you get into the offseason or however w- way you you want to want to do it here um it's a, as you said when they're healthy it's a deep roster um the i love i love the bogdanovic contract just because it's different than fournier fournier had a team option bogdanovic's got a, a partial two million dollars partial functionally though not not as a bonus of this trade they replaced the sort of like oh we can carry over this thing as a trade asset and also not have it if we don't want to have it they replaced that same thing almost functionally with bogdanovich well yeah i mean you look at in the in the offseason who's who is a bigger trade asset uh bogdanovich or evan fournier if they if it ever got to that no if you if you if you if you if, if something Something big came, and that's that was my concern all along with with Fournier was that what happens when you get past the trade deadline? Now you're forced to make a decision. You're forced to either um, decline the option or exercise it with the hope that you're going to be able to maybe flip him again. And uh, New York doesn't have to worry about that because there's a I think it's a June 28th trigger date as far as when it becomes guaranteed, and you'll have an idea as far as what is going to be available and what direction um, that you want to go in. But yeah, I mean, I thought certainly they were the big winners. I just I, I, for me with Detroit, and I hate saying like losers and stuff. I just think they were a year behind. They were kind of a year behind as a far year, as a year behind what? <laughs> a, year, <laughs> a year behind gauging the market for these guys. Like, oh, you think? Do you think this was? <laughs> you think this was a bad outcome for Boyan Bogdanovich? No, I have no idea if they could have gotten two firsts for him. I don't know if that's pie in this guy. One hundred percent. Take it to the bank, the bank of Presti, whatever bank you want. They could have got a first round pick for Boyan Bogdanovich. Um, but I don't want to get to Detroit yet. But I'm gonna yeah. make we're yep. all gonna make fun. It's gonna be great. Um, let's stick with the Knicks. Sure. I mentioned those four guys. So, like Barrett and quickly get you in and Obi, 26 years old, perfect playoff player, fits what they need. Grimes uh, helps you get this this poo-poo platter of good veteran players with shooting skills and ball handling skills to replace quickly from the Pistons. Toppin has kind of been forgotten about. Um Got them two seconds, but as I tell people, it got them the financial flexibility to re-sign Josh Hart, for whom they traded one bad first, like a low first, great trade, and to then sign DiVincenzo for a little bit less than the mid-level. They have gotten, they've traded, they, these young guys are gone, but in their place are like prime mid-career guys who fit Brunson, and less importantly, Randall, but still importantly, and it just can't be overstated. Like, what Jalen Brunson has become completely changed the trajectory of this franchise. It changed how the front office had to approach building a team. It changed their aspirations. It changed their timetable. It changed everything. When you got a player this good, and this is guy, this guy's going to make an all-NBA team as of now, I would think. I, I think you should have started the all-star game over Damian Lillard. You have to hit the gas a little bit, even though you have an eye on, well, maybe we can get a player that's quote-unquote better than him via trade somehow. And they've hit the gas, but in a responsible sort of um um, a sustainable way with these mid-career guys. And this team is like, look, Boston's the best team in the East still. 
Philly's obviously dealing with Embiid. Milwaukee's one and four under Doc Rivers. I think they'll find themselves. They got Pat Bev today. We can talk about that later. Cleveland is like 14 and one in its last 15 games. They're awesome. I do think that the challenge of reintegrating Garland and Mobley, who's now shooting and making some threes lately, by the way, will, will be interesting. This team's good, man. Like this team, this team's just really, really good. And now they're positioned to make real noise in the playoffs if they're healthy. Well, and it, the trade comes at the, at the perfect time too, because if you if you've watched them late, and certainly with um, with Randall out and and, and an OB, and then you know certainly Brunson sprains his ankle in in, in the Memphis game, man, the, the minutes were the minutes were getting high, and it's let's it's not it's not Tibbs. I mean, I mean, we can say oh Tibbs is overplaying these guys. It's basically, what he has right, he basically had he he had, he had a seven man rotation. That were playing, you know, the, your starters were playing 35, 36, min, uh, 36 minutes. So you, you you swab out four guys, and Grimes was the only guy out of that group that played um, of significant minutes. And now you had two guys that can play 30 plus minutes for you. I mean, Burks was, Burks, I think, was shooting 43% in the last five. He's been um, on a heat. He's he been on like terrific. a ridiculous heater. He was terrific uh, Wednesday night against Sacramento. I mean, him and Jay Ivey were terrific against um, Sacramento in that win. Bogdanovic's at 41 5, um, 47 playoff games under his belt. Um, he's been in big moments, certainly with um, Utah. I we drafted him. We drafted him in New Jersey. You know, one of the one of the great stories of when uh he made me miss my 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 son's uh daycare graduation because I was doing the trade call in the parking lot of the preschool. It's a so sad, I, it's a I, sad I image. Yeah, I don't owe anything. I'm bad against him though. But yeah, but you look at two quality guys that um that you know that 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 have come in and and as we've talked about just have the flexibility and i think the beauty of it zach is that the eastern conference is more forgiving than the western conference right now like where like milwaukee could figure it out itself out i know they're as you said you know one in four and they and but they're where are they where are they going they're going to go from two to three you're not going from you're not going from three to seven unless and maybe philly of do, course we could do you think when robin lopez got traded that that Thanasis Satentakumko was like, uh, uh would they uh oh is my iron <laughs> is my iron grip on this organization loosening? Am I am I next? When they broke up one set of untouchable brothers, what about me? Oh no, no. Thanasis, uh, the uh, running joke good. in the NBA, who's the most untradeable player in the league? Thanasis he, He's got the most who's got the most power in the NBA, right? Um, but yeah, so I listen, at the end of the day, New York did extremely well. They got out in front of the uh with Ananobi in late December. Um They've reshaped their roster. They've gotten flexibility. They've got draft picks still. They still got a bunch of seconds here, and they give themselves a chance um, over you know over the next couple months. Think about their lineup versatility. Like you can play Hart and Anobi and Bogdanovich together at the two, three, and the four. When Randall's when Randall rests and you stagger Brunson for the most part, think about the shooting now you can put around Brunson and a rim runner. If you want to play Randall at center now, if that becomes situationally something that Tibbs would actually do, you're just loaded with wing depth, big wing depth to do it. All the first round picks are still there. I think it's just a home run trade deadline for them. They lose almost nothing in terms of flexibility, nothing meaningful in terms of picks. And they are now a threat to a real threat to make the conference finals. And once you're that like, yeah, Celtics would be favored over them. I bet Milwaukee in the end will yeah. figure it out and and because they just have the top end talent, but they have not looked good recently. And I don't know if Pat Bev is the answer to enough questions, but it, maybe they'd be favored over the Knicks probably would, I guess Cleveland's really good, but like the Knicks could make the finals. Like that's on the table for them. The Knicks could make the finals and have assets to do a lot of stuff in the off season. And that's a rare place to be. Well, you know, I mean, someone will always become available. You know, somebody will lose in the in the first round here or second round, and you know, will want out, or a team's going to look to move it to make a deal. I think that um, the goal is now we've got what th about thirty games left. You've got to make sure you stay out of that Boston bracket, right? You got to make sure you're st yep. You got to be in that that bottom two three bracket here. And one of the teams, Milwaukee, Cleveland. And New York are going to be in, the, you know, they're going to be in the Boston bracket, right? That's just that's the reality. We, we kind of see where Philadelphia is going. I think Philadelphia is just, and we'll talk about them in a minute, are, is just kind of hanging on. Top six. Hopefully, you get the big guy back. Um, but you know, you don't want to fall into that. Um, shoot, you don't imagine imagine um Milwaukee, uh, Boston, um, Philadelphia, Miami playing seven eight. <laughs> Can you imagine something like that? By the way, I like the Buddy Heel trade for Philly. Um, 
I think it was cool. It was a like cork Maz Morris, three seconds for healed comes in and fills it. They just need someone to put the ball in the basket right now and shoot lots of threes. They don't shoot enough threes. You can sit here and quibble like, Oh, can you play with maxi defensively? Like, let's put like, let's put that. They just need to get some baskets now. And by the way, um, Woj is reporting that the Pacers now are going to wave Furkan yeah. Korkmaz hats off to Furkan Korkmaz, the longest running unfulfilled trade request <laughs> by a bit player in the history of the NBA was finally fulfilled and ends with a thud of the Pacers waving him immediately. Uh, I like the Pat Bev trade, the, I'm the, the, uh, the Buddy Hill trade uh, for Philly. Uh, my mind is all over the place. Before we get anywhere else, though, um, let me just pause and talk about the Pistons for a second. Here, I, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think I have this right. This is the sum total of the Pistons activity in the last 24 hours, beginning with the acquisition of Simone Fontecchio, who fits right into the Pistons' quote, young core. Simone Fontecchio is 28 years old. Let's dial back the like, oh, another prospect for the Detroit Pistons. He can shoot. The Pistons have suddenly discovered shooting is a helpful thing to have on your team. So, okay, I think I think this is it. Incoming, Fontecchio, fine player, one of three uh, Utah rotation players that was traded. Fournier hasn't played in uh, seemingly years. Archie Diacono, whatever. Grimes, I still have hope for Grimes as a support player. He just doesn't do much, but he's fine. Probably a nice bench guy. Um, I believe four second round picks total incoming. Four seconds. Yep. And then the Troy Brown Jr., Shake Milton, Daniel House, none of whom are really going to be relevant to their team, I don't think. So four seconds. You can boil it down if you want to four seconds, Grimes and Fontecchio. Outgoing for that, for four seconds, Grimes and Fontecchio. Bogdanovich, Burks, a really good second from the Wizards, so net yep. three seconds. And then you have Monty Morris, who got traded to the Wolves, Procida, this prospect people like, and Kevin Knox. I just don't really understand what's going on there. Like, I don't see how you just net, net that much for Bogdanovich and Burks. Fontecchio's fine. Grimes is fine. Like, it's all – those guys are fine. I don't really see any sort of through line connecting any of those transactions. And then the kicker was the release of Killian Hayes, the release. The dude started an NBA game yesterday, number seven pick in 2021 over Tyrese Halliburton, one of many Pistons draft misses in the top 10 or 12. And we don't need to recount all of them. I just look, I like Cunningham. I like Duran. I like Asar Thompson and Ivy's playing out of his mind lately at 37. That's great. I just don't understand like really what happened with the Pistons. I don't get it. Do you get well, it? Is there any, what, am I no, missing something? No, I don't. And, and when you talk to, as you do, as you do, and as I do, we talked to a lot of teams that you're like, what, what's the trade doing? And I said, well, I think I, I said the, my biggest joy of the deadline is trying to find out, like, where are all these guys, you know, you're taking in, se you're taking in seven, you're trading out three, like, and then we find out. Did they, did they make more trades than they have wins for the season? <laughs> I think they did. I think they did. And then, they, and then certainly, you know, you wave Joe Harris, who was your big free agent addition um, with Monty Morris. And we haven't seen uh, Joe Harris since the Milwaukee playoff series in the second round uh, in 21. And, Listen, I, as I said when, when we were doing the Knicks segment here, like they were basically asleep at the wheel, a, a, you know, a year ago. And instead of probably getting more value for Bogdanovic um, in uh, last February here, um, you get two seconds um, and a, you know, a young, a young wing, um, you know, in Quentin Grimes. I don't get it. Don't get the asset, man. I mean, look, if Grimes hits, I don't really know what Grimes hitting looks like. Um, you know, I think like a really good outcome would be something like Danny Green, like a fifth starter who defends pretty well and shoots threes and pretty much that's it. Um, and I and Grimes can like pump and go and keep the offense moving with drives uh, against closeouts here and there. He just hasn't been very active. Fontecchio, I just I think is a nice player. A, a lot of teams were kicking around Fontecchio. As soon as Utah got that second round pick offered for him, which is the Wizards' second round pick this year, they were like, "Oh, that's it. We're done. You can have Simone Fontecchio. Like that pick is better than anything we're going to get for him." Um, 
Pistons fans better brace themselves for the Tobias Harris pursuit of uh, the summer of 2024 because it's coming. Probably, maybe, probably. Um, uh, any parting uh, Nick's, Nick's thoughts? Just, I mean, we can sit here and look ahead, but who's going to become available? This yeah, team fails, yeah, that star is available. Of, like, yeah, I don't really got, even care. I want to see this team no. play. This is a really good team. I mean, they've got a bunch of roster spots available, and I'm sure they'll explore who becomes um, co- becomes available. Probably unlikely. I think Kyle Lowry probably has more Philadelphia kind of written all over him as far as that. But, um, you know, I'm sure – I'm sure Tibbs' favorite, Taj Gibson, they've got a home for him as far as from one of those roster spots here. But no, all in all, um, a really good day for the Knicks. Let's let's shift conferences and talk about something that didn't happen, which is that the Lakers did not make any trades. And and notably, the Lakers did not trade for DeJounte Murray and the Atlanta Hawks did not trade DeJounte Murray. Uh, so much noise ended up uh, uh, not amounting to anything. Um I just don't think the Lakers had enough to get to get Murray. Um, you could you could package, you know, Austin Reeves was off the table, mm-hmm. and I think that's a correct stance by the Lakers. I think anything swapping Austin Reeves for Dejounte Murray is a lateral move that doesn't really make a difference, and so why do it? Um, could you have gotten the Hawks' attention with D'Angelo Russell plus Max Christie plus an unprotected twenty twenty nine pick? I think you could have gotten their attention. I'm not sure that gets over the finish line. I'm not sure that's enough for the Hawks, given what they traded for DeJounte Murray, which is a lot of draft assets. And so now the Lakers, who are um, ninth in the West, need to just sort of make it happen. They need to make it happen after LeBron James, who has a player option for next season, did his usual passive-aggressive emoji stuff, tweet stuff, and then was like, what, who, me? Huh? It's not my job. Um, made it very clear he would like to see upgrades. The upgrades did not happen. And on the flip side of all of this, like like the Hawks have to sort of come back to business and be like, oh, Jonathan, you're still on the team. And I think it sets up an interesting summer for them and for the Lakers. Wouldn't surprise me if these two teams intersected again in the summer. And I think one of the things that happened here is the Hawks, like the Wizards with Kyle Kuzma and other teams, as we talked about, kind of looked at the landscape, said, okay, Lakers, you have one first round pick you can trade right now. In the summer, you'll have three. Come back, come back to us then. Um, Kyle Kuzma, same thing. Oh, Dallas, you got one first round pick you can trade for us. Come back to us in the summer when you'll have three. Well, Dallas is now gone out of that discussion, having acquired PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford. Um, and maybe that's the correct calculation. Maybe it's not one person pointed out to me that sounds right. And there's 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 some theoretical rightness to that. The flip side of that is that you have tweeted and written nine teams are going to be yeah. in the second apron. Is that still true after today? Yeah, we haven't seen anybody duck out. And, I mean, what, and what that listen, means is is yeah. everyone focuses on what that means for the second apron teams, all the things they can't do. They can't aggregate salaries. They can't do this. But, well, it also means that like if you're trying to trade DeJounte Murray, you got nine fewer teams yeah. that you can deal with once that second apron kicks in. Wouldn't surprise me if these two teams intersect again, and it wouldn't surprise me if the Lakers knock on the door and say, "Hey, what about the other guard? Can we can we get in the discussion for that guy?" Um, and what happens with the Hawks and Dejounte Murray and Trey Young in the next year is one of the more interesting subplots in the NBA. But tell me what you think of the Lakers standing pat here. Well, here's the one thing that's pretty interesting, and, and as you learn, you go through this trade deadline, and they had that. Um that that 2029 first available they could have went to the bank of sam presti maybe right maybe they could have done a swap in 20 uh, what is it 28 what do they owe it a first to utah in 27 i think done a swap like dallas did and try to get a 2024 first i'm just hypothetically saying that here um my, what i thought about the lakers was that they a they just didn't have enough. Um, B they thought the you know maybe it's just kind of smoke and mirrors here that the play of D'Angelo Russell over the last whatever it be five to ten games here um, was enough for us to sit pat. Um, here's one thing where I'm interested about. I've talked to a lot of a lot of people. Why didn't the Lakers be a little bit of a seller and and would have been would it have been a bad perception on them? $1.26 million over the luxury tax. Okay. Why don't you move off 
one of your bigs, Jackson Hayes or Christian Wood or one of the, and duck under the tax. And then you don't become a repeater tax anymore from a financial. And I get, I get there's a perception that you're trying to upgrade and then all of a sudden you're trading the guy and now you're, you're below and there's a financial angle there. I get it. Um, but I thought if there wasn't anything that you could do as far as marginally around the edges, why don't you, why don't you move off that? You know, you're not going to be able to trade cash in the off season here. Why don't you move off one of those contracts? Maybe just perception. Um, look, they know LeBron has a player option, right? And they know he's made his wishes a pretty clear what he wanted them to do. I honestly like you look at what was out there. I'm not a big D'Lo guy. The dude is making shots and he's taking like audacious shots. Like that dude will pull up on a three on one with LeBron and AD on the wings and be like, I'm just going to shoot this three. And it's been going in. I think Murray's better than him. Just more north, south, fourth. D D'Lo doesn't get to the rim. Better defensively. all Faster. All that stuff that the Lakers need. But I don't think he's like a first-round pick better. I, yeah. I, and I don't think any of these trades really meaningfully close the gap between the Lakers and the four best teams in the West. It's essentially a four-way tie for a first in the West right now. A couple of those teams could be beatable in a playoff series for the Lakers, but they would need to bring their A plus game every single game. A couple of those teams, like I don't think they could beat the Clippers or the Nuggets in a playoff series. Um, almost under any circumstances. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. They proved a lot of people wrong last year. At some point, you just gotta accept this is what we are. Let's see if we can make a run. And by the way, they're starting Hachimura, which I've been lobbying for them to do all year. Finally, they're doing it. They're playing Reeves, Hachimura, LeBron, and AD together with D'Lo, and they're playing their those are their four best players. I the four players that fit together in functional, important ways. I think they'll probably hit a nice stable patch. Now, I don't really think it's a crisis that they didn't do anything. I don't know that there was really going to be a common ground with Atlanta. And on LeBron, look, I can't sit here and be like, oh yeah, I've had, you know, I know what LeBron wants out of life. Everything I've heard for years, including today, is if he has his druthers, he would like to finish his career with the Lakers. Um, You know, there are pipe dream scenarios out there where like, well, Philly has all this cap space. Could he opt in and ask for a trade to Philly? Like, I just don't, I haven't heard that those things are real. I think he wants to finish his career a Laker. I think he will probably opt in as Wendy said, he's really opting out of $51 million. And I think, you know, if you slow down and zoom out, winning that title in 2020 I think this whole thing feels different if they don't have that. He came to L.A. and he got a fourth ring. He got a ring for the Lakers. And if he's able to feel at peace with, like, I might just be on a good team, not a great one, if I stay with the Lakers for the rest of my career. If he's able to feel, and I don't know if he is, I think that title is why. And if you talk to people around him, that title really changes the perception of how maybe everyone feels about what this Lakers run is is and could be going forward but i don't you know i don't have any strong i, I think the lakers are fine to stamp out. I, mean, I know they looked around they looked everywhere yeah i mean listen at the end of the day they've they've totally have turned over their roster i mean there's only four guys remaining from from last december here and eventually you just kind of run out of things right like i mean the vanderbilt injuries hurts right that's gonna be like if there's a if there's something that's kind of hanging over um and who knows when he comes back that's that hurts as far as you know big versatile um you know big um that we saw last year in, in, in the playoffs here and who knows when we when you get get back gabe vincent here and it's like you know what we just put away what we have we'll re get re um regroup in the off season here um and as you said like there wasn't like you know besides really DeJounte Murray, there wasn't a like there wasn't guys out there. Like there wasn't that many, like um, you know, high level. It would have cost you, you know, listen, if you want to go get Kyle Kuzma if try, you know, it would probably cost you a good one and something else. Like something else. And that's you know, that's kind of where, you know, when you know Dallas and we'll talk about the Mavericks in a minute, Dallas tried to make a strong play for him. Um, and they just they didn't have enough, they had enough to get PJ Washington, they didn't have enough to get Kyle Kuzma. And like you could sit here and say, well, why didn't the Lakers go get like a Royce O'Neal who went to Phoenix for three second round picks? It's a great deal for Phoenix, yeah. By the way, um, but and I like people were kind of shitting on the David Roddy deal, uh, which they they did the thing that I joked about. They split up their swap again. They are like Voldemort. They have split their soul <laughs> so many times. They split up another swap and they got David Roddy. I think I I kind of like David Roddy. He just kind of 
goes around and hits people. He doesn't make jump shots. He needs to make more jump shots. But Royce O'Neal will play for the Suns and gives them another option to play Durant at center. Like, that's a good trade. I just, like, Phoenix is in a position to make that trade and think this could actually elevate us into the finals conversation because when we've got these three guys healthy, we've been pretty damn good. The Lakers are not in a position where they're like, oh, let's go splurge on Royce O'Neal. That's the missing piece. The Hawks, do you have any thoughts on the Hawks? I mean, we you guys talked about, and we talked about last night over the phone privately, the the Hawks, Pelicans talks. Yeah. Um, those teams definitely talked yep. about DeJounte Murray going to New Orleans. I don't think those, according to my reporting, I don't think those talks really got far. And if you start piecing together all the, like the Pelicans want, well, they wanted DeJounte Murray to some degree. They want rim protection so you can put two and two together who would come from yeah. Atlanta, one of the bigs. It just starts to get unwieldy pretty fast in terms of how big the salaries are and who the players are. I think the Nets took a look at DeJounte Murray, but I don't, I don't, again, you can tell me what you've heard. Everyone hears different things. I don't get the sense that the Nets were like super duper interested. And if they were, I think like what he'd be on one of these teams. Yeah. I mean, um, First with um, first with New Orleans, certainly um, they had their eyes on Anyeka Okongu. That I mean, and but and what and what's happened with him? He's played really well. I mean, last I think he started last two or three games. Here. Yeah, with Capella out, he's yeah he's I mean, now I double last, doubling. I think his last five games, like seventeen and eight, seventeen and nine, somewhere around there. He's not even in year one of that rookie extension, which is that a, a really good number. So why are you why are you getting off that number and and then then you look at New Orleans you know um, C J McCollum was not going to be part of the deal right we 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 fl- all the information that we got we flushed that out he was not part of the deal so now who is would if you're New Orleans I mean if you're Atlanta who's coming back was it Valanciunas probably because if you swap in center for center and then. What See, else? if CJ was not part of it, then it was yep. just, to me, it was just never a thing. Because yeah. obviously it's not going to be Ingram. It's not going to be Zion. It's like, yep. the, what, the, what are we talking about yeah, here? Yeah, I mean, would you? I guess it, I guess you could stack up if Herb you're going to throw a million guess, picks Herb in. Jones and Dyson Daniels yeah. and got, you know, stuff like that. I'm not trading maybe... those guys if I'm New Orleans. Those dudes are good, especially Herb's on a great contract. I'm not trading him. Yeah, I mean, and that's like, uh, New Orleans is another one of these teams like, Get them in the playoffs. See what they see what they're missing. Zion was terrific last night. Um, Thursday, uh, Wednesday night against the Clips. Man, he was awesome. Like just kind of moving guys around. Um, so I think for Atlanta, it's just like this is the danger of trade deadline trades in the regular season because there's the emotional element too, right? Their games are going on. We're winning a little bit. We played well. We beat Phoenix. We beat Golden State. Um, we were competitive against the Clippers here. Maybe we do have a chance. Maybe we could be Miami of last year where we were the eighth seed and we win a playing game and now we we get a chance at well, I mean, good luck against Boston. And it's like I'm, I'm it's just like we've seen enough body of work before with Nate McMillan and now Quinn Snyder here is that this team is kind of who they are, right? They are, um, you know, a below 500 team. And I've always thought, you know, I haven't really said public, like I would honestly look at moving Trey, right? If you want to like a restart or kind of like, like kind of like a, like kind of meet in the middle type thing, keep Murray moved, look to move Trey and then get as much as you can for him. Well, a wise man in the league on a team that's not involved in any of the stuff we've talked about always reminds me when you get all super deep into the trade deadline and start projecting teams futures and what's next. Remember that the playoffs reveal everything. The playoffs tell you everything you need to know about a team. Teams find out things about themselves. Directions change because of the playoffs. The Hawks are not going to make the top six. They should make the play in tournament barring a disaster as they have the last two years, or at least the last year. Yeah. Um, I think two years. Uh, let's see how they play because even against Boston last year in the first round, when they looked like they were going to get totally outclassed by the end of that series, they got pretty close to forcing yeah. that to go the distance and Trey, you know, I think the Hawks had this idea of we're going to surround Trey with long defenders and a rim protector in Capella. And we're going to mimic the Warriors and cover for him defensively and let him sing on offense because that dude is an offense unto himself, an incredible passer, an incredible shot maker. And when he's rolling, like he got during that Boston series, like he got during the 2021 playoffs, 
he can break your defense. Like it may not last a full seven game series. He may go a little cold from three. He's only so, so when it's rolling, he can single handedly bust your defense. <clears throat> and what happened to the Hawks is like, none of those defensive things really worked. Like Deandre Hunter didn't become the defender. They thought um, Sadiq Bay is not the defender. They hoped he would be Jalen Johnson. I think will get there. Um, you know, I don't know, but my point is if they, if, if they in these next 30 games show you something, then that may lead them one way. If they in these next 30 games just kind of muck around where they are and then get roasted in the play-in tournament, then I think anything should be on the table and will be on the table for them. Um, let's talk about some other teams. Uh, but by what on Royce O'Neal, because we're not going to spend too much time on yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> one reason I really like it for the Suns is he's he's gonna be typecast as a three and D guy, and he is, and he's not as big as people think Royce O'Neal. He's six four. He's not like a power forward, he's kind of masqueraded as one at times. Um, but he is a live body. He likes to move around. He likes to do random stuff, set random screens, set random handoffs. Um, he can attack off the, off a closeout. He's had a lot of games this year for the Nets where he look at the box where he's like, wow, Royce O'Neal has like five assists, six assists. He's a mover of the ball in himself. And I think the Suns need a little of that randomness injected into their offense now and then. I think he'll be good um, for that. Can I tell you my... my uh, well, and the other thing too regarding that, real quick, is that they didn't have to use the Nasir Little contract. So you can you have I mean they basically gobbled together four minimum guys to flip to, to I think two went to Utah went to Memphis I believe and um, he did two, it's a homecoming and Goodwin and Bates D up went to um went went to Brooklyn. So you still have the Little contract to to use if you need it. I guess in in the off season here. Um, I'll tell you the trade they got me most excited. I do. I actually fist pumped. I've been saying all year, I want them to do something. And I said repeatedly, including to you on this podcast, my gut says they're going to do something. The Oklahoma City Thunder trading Bertans, Michich, and Trey Mann, who deserves a chance that he's going to get one. He was not going to get one in Oklahoma City. And I think two seconds yeah. for Gordon Hayward, who yep. from what I've heard is healthy and about ready to go, ready to play. Look, you can sit here and laugh like he's never healthy, this and that. He's not the same explosive athlete he was, and I've talked about how I think about that injury in his first game as a Celtic like every other day, all the sliding doors that slid open and closed because of that one thing, maybe. I love that they did something, I and I like the fit a lot. I've been saying all year, everyone talks about the Thunder League. They could either do nothing or they have to make the gigantic trade where they trade everything for a star. There's such a big middle ground between that. And this team is so good that they're like one decent player away from being a real threat to make the finals. If that, well, here he is. This guy, Gordon Hayward, Phil, like, and you've seen teams aren't going to guard Josh Giddy. Teams are really going to make Lou Dort prove it from three and off the dribble. And Gordon Hayward, for as far as he's fallen outside the discourse, outside the spotlight, he's kind of, he's a 15, five and five guy who moves the ball. He's essentially a four now. Like he's he's big and he can play the four. He's a 40% plus spot up three point shooter. He's a good passer. He knows where to be. He's unselfish. I think he'll plug and play right into this team. And they needed a guy who could come off the bench, but also be good enough to close games for them and have the skill set that uh just the shooting playmaking skill set that they've really thrived on. I think he fits like a glove. I think this is an awesome trade. And everyone wanted them to get size, and I get it. I get it. Chet's skinny. They're a bad rebounding team. I get it. I think, and people throw out Capella and other rim runner types. I think people underestimate the mileage they've gotten out of playing five out, of what that does for Shea's driving lanes, of what that allows them to do playing Giddy and Dort, who are not the most threatening perimeter players, though Dort has shot it well this year. If you introduce a rim runner, and say you're now playing 25 minutes a game, that's a sea change to your offense with 30 games left in the season. I think this trade threads the needle, and I think Minnesota, on a smaller scale, checked a lot of boxes with Monte Morris. But, you know, of the teams at the top of the West, most of them were pretty quiet. The Clippers did their job early in the season with Harden. I think this is a great move for the Thunder. What am I missing? No, you're not missing anything. I mean, it's a it's a low risk, high reward trade, and and, and there was actually a point um, 
during you know when it when it came out that you know Hayward has his trade bonus in his deal, and that started to complicate a little bit of things as far as how to make the money work, right? Like you're they were short, and as far as <clears throat> that got, <clears throat> that got resolved, and you look at it. Oklahoma City didn't have to touch any of their core, their top, probably a top 11, right? I mean, Mann, Bertans, um, you know, those guys hadn't been playing. They had 21 seconds. I mean, so you, you're using two of those there. And if, you know, if Hayward's healthy, it's a high, high reward type, type deal. Now, here's the other thing, too. Financially, there's a window now. There's a little bit of a window this offseason coming up before you've got to pay um, Chet and you've got to pay Jalen Williams and then eventually Shea down the road here. So they, you know, they're going to be looking at, you know, you know, 35, 40 million dollars in room. You know, they're they're a significant room team here. And I'm not saying they're going to go out and get Paul George, for example, here, but they have they have the flexibility to, to keep on out or maybe they want to, they want Gordon plays really well and he's healthy and you want to sign him to a one year, $20 million deal. Like, so you have the ton of flexibilities, but on the court, I thought, I thought it was a no brainer. They're, you know, they were one of my, you know, they were one of my winners. I liked what they did. I like Charlotte. I liked uh, Dallas, you know, those, you know, certainly besides New York and, and Philly. Um, but I liked what, um, what Oklahoma city was able to do. Um, I, I think it's a great move. And, and this, this roster, these players earned the right to have a real shot in the playoffs to make noise. And I do think, they were one guy away from like, okay, now you're not that they, they weren't maybe even, I mean, the stats say they're not one guy away. I just like beefing up the rotation. I like the skill set that's been added. Shea, right in his prime, deserves a front office to not go all in, but step in a little yeah. bit and not be so precious with its picks. And it did that without getting a player that fits, without really coughing up anything of meaning in terms of draft equity. Uh, home run, Thunder are scary. Before we get to Dallas, who had maybe yeah. the most interesting trade deadline, let's do a couple of quick hitters. <sighs> what are the Bulls doing? Oh, <clears throat> do the Bulls know that the trade deadline was happening? Were they like, you, what is all this stuff going on on, on you, Twitter? Do you know what's, that? What is this? You know, it's amazing. You know, when I was writing their offseason guide, I mean, they're not off. Well, that's going to happen soon. <laughs> their offseason guide. When when I'm writing their, you know, their trade guide, you know, the last trade in season trade they made was, or last trade they made that didn't involve like drop, buying a pick was marketing. Back in 2000, what was that 21? What did they get for him? I they traded like Derek Jones Jr. and they got the Portland. They get the Portland. Um, they were part of that three team deal. He went. To, they did uh, not get very much for Lowry. Yeah, Martin. let's um, put it that way. So, and the last regular season trade was the infamous um, Orlando trade in uh, in 2021. So, they have not been active during the regular season. But it, like, it's my like. Here it is again. Like you have a great win against Minnesota, and 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 our tourist Karnishevis came out and said, "Yeah, we like I like how we're playing. We're playing good basketball right now." But you're still, you know, three or four games under five hundred. It's like kind of like pick a direction, right? Like pick well, a direction. And I know lots of ha it's happened. You had the you know Lonzo out, uh, Levine out. Um, you know, Caruso's on a great contract. What happens? Maybe the, the you know the Rosen's going to be a free agent, but the you know the value wasn't. Teams weren't willing to to give you. Um, a ton for them. And I think what Chicago was looking at, and when you talk to teams, Chicago was trying to emulate what Toronto did when they moved off. And I've, I've heard the same. And I heard you say that. And yeah, yeah it just, it's not, ha it's, it, you know, how hard that was to pull off there. That's like one, what's like one in a hundred type deals there. Alex Caruso is how old I, I would have to look it up. Yeah. Um, he's not, he's not OG and an Obi. Um, in terms of in terms of his skill set and stature, and he doesn't even have the salary really to bring back a, a massive Liam, like a really a two really good players like R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel Quickly. <clears throat> Demar Derozan certainly is he's thirty almost thirty five years old. Like you're just those player. Alex Cruz is a good player. He is not going to get you the same return value in terms of present day players from from a. a forget picks like picks they could have gotten they could have gotten two first round picks for alex caruso i'm pretty sure um in terms of like if you want present day talent if that's what you want he's just not going to bring back the same level of that for many reasons and demar derozan isn't either and i just can't believe 
that we've arrived here with DeMar DeRozan, who's going to hit free agency, presumably. And just like, I don't, what are they? I just don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. No, I, 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 I totally get it. And, you know, I mean, you weren't going to get you weren't going to get the haul back for for DeRozan and especially a guy on um, on an expiring contract here. But here they are. I mean, they're kind of, you know, a little bit of an I guess a little bit of a different situation than Atlanta. Atlanta at least has their guys under contract here, so at least you can you can flip you know some of your guys here. I had heard, you know, you know that they were active trying to move off that Lonzo Ball contract. Um, you know, who had a uh, he's got a player option for for next year, and who knows if he's going to. Be but that would have cost attaching something that you only had really the Portland pick here and a future first down, down, down the road here. Um, so yeah, I, I thought Chicago would have been um, a lot more active here, but the the trend is, um, you know, with our tourists in the front office, they're not a team that moves around a lot outside of that 2021 year when, when, um, you know, they made a bunch of trades there. Well, Caruso to answer my own question is turning 30 at the yeah. end of the month. Um, and that that New York Toronto deal and an OB for Baird and quickly plus some other stuff, that was a very unusual deal. It was yeah. very rare to see players good three good players twenty six and under exchange like that between two team one team. It was not a traditional buyer seller kind of deal. It didn't look that way. Um, it's a hard deal to emulate, and it's just it's not emulatable with these Bulls players. And DeRozan, I, look, maybe they'll th- maybe they'll pr- thread the needle like. But they're in a position right now where they could lose him for nothing. Yeah. Or they could re-sign him to a, a, a contract like they did with Vooch that at at its best is going to be eh. And at its worst is going to just be something that you're stuck with. Maybe they find a third way and sign and trade him or do something creative, but that's where they are here. And I just don't their fans are furious and like I don't really I just I don't get I just don't get how you can I just don't get how you can look at Alex Caruso's contract, his age, and his and his and the state of your team, and turn up your nose at multiple first round picks potentially for Alex Caruso. If if indeed that was on the table, you know it's funny we did a um, we did a, a Woj YouTube show um, earlier on Thursday after the, the uh, after the show on ES on the regular show on ESPN. Cassidy was hosting it, and, and I Cassidy was like spitting fire, man. <laughs> she was so like, what do we do? And she's a big Bulls fan. She's just like, what are we doing here, man? Like, even, what, like, even, what is going Benny on? The, even Benny the Bull looks a little his po- <laughs> his little popcorn orgies that he has in the stands. They don't have the same, they don't have the same euphoric <laughs> hedonism to them these days. Uh, okay, um, what do you think of Pat Beverly to the Bucks? Yeah, I mean, so you look at it like two different ways, right? Why would Philadelphia move it? And I think a big reason why is I think they've got uh, Kyle Lowry lined up as far as if, if, if he's bought out of his contract in um, in Charlotte as far as to replace him. And why w- why would it make sense to have Pat Bev and Kyle together here? I like it from Milwaukee, man. And I know it's not like, you know, Pat Bev. From, like, there's like, you need a little bit of a spitfire there. You need a little bit of a... You know, a little bit of an edge, a little bit of a raw, raw guy on a team that's, you know, trying to find its find its way. Um, so I I like it for um, you know, listen, Milwaukee was really limited as far as what they could do. They had a um they had two seconds that were available. Um, one was a Portland one that they still have. They had a I think the one they traded was in like two thousand their own in two thousand twenty seven. Um th- you know, they weren't, you know, they weren't moving Bobby Portis for Grant Williams. Right. Like that was not happening. And they looked and I, around. They all the reporting on them trying to get in on Finney Smith, I think was accurate. Yep. They were searching around to try to get a first. Well, I they tried they, getting in. They tried getting in on DeJounte Murray. We, I, we kept, I kept on hearing their name. You know, you talk to a lot of teams, you kept on in your thing. Like, well, how, like, how are you going to, you know, unless you're going to do, I don't know, more, more swaps and other things and try to do what Phoenix did and swap a swap and, and go in that direction here. But, I mean, you're really only looking at Portis and Connaughton and, you know, maybe some of those young players there. And I look, if you had a wing or a guard who's good at defense and is not a star, I think they probably called you about that. But like I heard they called Cleveland about Isaac Okoro and didn't yeah. get anywhere. Like they tried. I think Pat, Pat Bev's fine. Pat Bev's yeah. good. Uh, I, he's not going to start, I would imagine. Um, and so. I, I just don't know how many minutes he's going to play. He'll help on the bench. He'll help their defensive identity. Are they going to close games with Dame, Beverly, Middleton, Giannis, and Lopez? Or he's going to close over Malik Beasley if they have a lead and they need defense? Maybe. Like maybe he's a capable offensive player too. Like I, I think I think for what they had, 
it's a fine deal. It does not really change my opinion of 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 the Bucks in in the aggregate too much. No, I no, I I I mean, I totally totally agree with you. And I know they're I, I think one and what one and four here. I they've played better defensively here. I I think they will eventually figure it out. I mean, they're going to be judged what happens in April, April and May. They'll be judged. Clippers Clippers talked to all the th- people you think they talked to, including the Nets about the Nets wings. You know. Royce O'Neal was one of them. I think they just, they just they circled the wagons for trying to get one more guy. But the the obstacle, from what I heard, the obstacles they ran into are, number one, P.J. Tucker's $11 million player option for next season, which he's obviously going to pick up, was not yeah. an attractive thing. And number two, they have one first-round pick left to trade. Yeah. They're going to be in the second apron next year, so their 2032 first-round pick, which is not tradable yet, will get frozen. Yeah. yeah. So if they had traded this pick – they would have essentially been out of trade equity in perpetuity. Yeah. And they were going to be very cautious about doing that unless it was for an impact guy. Honestly, I don't really think they need to do anything. I think they're loaded. I think they're fine. I had some people say, oh, they should really get daring and look what they can get for man or Zubat. No, the, the way they're playing, I'm not messing with it. No, I'm not, I mean, listen, you're in a you're in the top two, top three of the Western Conference. You made your big trade. The Harden trade was your big trade, and they and they, they had an you know, basically a, lo- a longer runway than most teams because they've had him since November here. I didn't, you know, you mentioned the first, you know, you certainly heard Bones Highland as a guy, marginal trade there, maybe moving off, open up a roster spot, maybe. They tried, you know, they tried to get some yeah. seconds for him. Yeah. So, um, so I was not surprised, um, you know, especially as you said, PJ with the second year, likely pick, he's going to pick that up. Um, hard to find takers um, for that contract. It's a little one, but I I really liked uh, I like Boston getting Xavier Tillman for two second round picks. I think that really like he's a Xavier Tillman is on my you're just happy they're around guys. It's like oh you don't play for two weeks, you come in. It's like oh my god, Xavier Tillman had 15 and eight and played alongside a traditional center and then played center himself. And then he when we asked him to switch, he was like pretty good at switching. When we asked him to drop, he was all right at that. Made a little jump hook. Made a corner three. I know he's shooting like 22%. Just let me have it. Like Xavier Tillman. A little versatility. No harm, no foul. I like that one. I like Jaden Springer, too. I mean, like, listen, you gave up a um, uh, a second for him. And w- what's going to happen is, is that it's almost like they stole a little bit of the playbook of what Denver did at the draft um, th- this year. They knew their salaries are going to be high. They went out and got a bunch of seconds. They, you know, they've got a first here. They need these young players on these, like, controllable contracts here. For a player that's got, um, I think another year after he's got this year and the next year, um, two, three guy can maybe go, you know, he can guard, um, I, I, you know, some just bench protection as far as, you know, you know, with, uh, with, with some of your depth there. I'm trying to think if there's any other ones I want to hit. Philly got, we talked about Heal. Well, Dallas. We're going to get to Dallas. Oh, okay. Philly, Philly, we talked about Heal. They called about Brogdon. I don't think they got anywhere with Brogdon. I don't think they got anywhere, but I I thought DeRozan maybe for them. Yeah, I, don't really... I did. I went on we I went on TV and did it the more DeRozan. I did a DeRozan uh, Andre Drummond package to uh to uh to Andre Drummond the... still on the Bulls. Well, that's that's the <clears throat> that's the like listen, your draft equity is like I think Chicago has one or two seconds available in the kitty. Like like you know, flip the guy for you could probably get two twos for him. But man, you watched them the other night. They're going twin towers to finish games. You know, him and Vooch. It's the old school. It worked. It kind of worked in that one game. But it was against Minnesota. So yeah. I think they they went size for size in that one and counted on the Wolves to crap the bed in the fourth quarter in overtime, which they did. Um uh Brogdon, Philly, whatever. Okay. Um Monty Morris, we talked about like that yeah, one. Yeah, Toronto, did Toronto, Utah do anything? I'm going to say, I'm going to save Toronto, Utah oh, for Kevin Pelton, okay. who's going to come out of the bullpen oh, sorry. pretty soon. Yep, yep. Um, okay, Dallas is wins my award for maybe the most interesting team yeah. of the trade deadline. Um, two major transactions, uh, although I guess there were a sub transaction in between. We'll, we'll go through them. First, um, they traded Rashawn Holmes, who has uh, what a $12 million player option for next season. Yes. Uh, and uh, a 2024 first round pick. Yes. To the Wizards for Daniel Gafford, who will presumably be Derek Lively's backup. First round pick for a backup. They went to the there. Bank of Presti. Yes. Yeah, so that 2024 first round pick they acquired by trading the Thunder pick swap rights with, with them, Dallas, in 2028. 
Then in a separate transaction, they traded Grant Williams. The Grant Williams era in Dallas. We will always. What was your favorite memory from the Grant Williams era in Dallas? Oh my goodness. Was it when Luca was like a week into the season being like, he really talks a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, there, I, I'd have to look back as far as what my favorite was. <laughs> oh, that um, one where his face got like stepped on, right? Was that one? Or was that last year in Boston? That might've been in Boston last year. Anyway, the Mavs <laughs> trade Grant Williams, a top two protected Ooh. first round pick in 2027, which was the o only pick they had to trade. And I believe yeah. it has to roll over immediately, right? Like, yes. it's not, yeah. Um, yes. and, uh, to the Charlotte Hornets for PJ Washington, who I I'm guessing will step in and start immediately for the Mavs. And I've been singing PJ Washington's praises uh, as someone I would try to steal from the thunder. Yeah. I would not qualify this as a steal or a heist. So I, I think you, you put four starters in pen when they're healthy, Kyrie, Luca, PJ Washington, and lively. The, the fifth guy could be Josh Green, who's playing well. It could be Exum, who had been playing well but is hurt. It could be Derek Jones Jr., who's been serviceable for them. Then on the bench, you have one of Kyrie and Luca on the floor at all times. Hardaway, Gafford is your backup five. And then, again, the same jumble of guys. For, uh, for Seth Curry also got traded into this. Too. I forgot yeah. about him. Sorry, Seth. Um, that's, a, that's a good team. I have seen people, including very smart people like David Thorpe, proclaim the Mavericks the winners of the 2024 trade deadline. What do you think? Yeah, listen, there's two ways to look at it. Like it's, it's the, you, you had you, so you enter today with, as you said, your 2027 first and two seconds. That's your draft equity. Okay. And you were able to turn that around and get that first from OKC in 24 and get what, here's my analogy. I look at the, what Dallas did was, and I'm going to use a baseball analogy. They went basically went out and got two middle relievers, guys that can come in the seventh inning. Dennis like, Cook and Turk Wendell. That with is the right. Those guys win, and those guys win games, man. Like they're not the high level. Like they'll come in and strike out. You know, they need lefty, lefty, right? Kind of throw the know. rosin bag, baby. <laughs> That's how I look at it: is guys that are not high profile, but just kind of fit as far as what they're doing, as far as. You know, um, Gafford behind Lively, certainly um, with PJ as far as starting or you, you know, maybe have him come off the bench. He can play multiple positions here. And, you know, Jason Kidd said this, and I've, listen, I've worked with, with Jason. I, he, was, he was a player. He was a coach. And Jason, I'm sure, was on the front offices behind with upgrade. Like, hey, we need this guy. We need this guy here. And and he, Jason is out in front. And he says, you know, when you have Luca. You got to do everything possible to continue to put talent around him. So there was, there was, I think, a pressure there. And, and, and we know Woj talked about it, that they went after Kuzma. There's no secret about that. Um, just didn't think they had enough with, um, with, with Kyle here, who's got one of the great, you know, he's got a really good contract that descends. Um, and there's value maybe to flip him if you're the Wizards in the, in the offseason here. Um, but I, I like what they, they did. Um, the draft picks are the draft picks. Um, you could, you know, listen, you could say like, wait a minute, like you, you forgot to sit, mention that they also owe a swap in 30 with San Antonio. That was part of the sign and trade to get Grant Williams here. Um, and I get the draft part of it here, but I thought from a, just on the court, they did a nice job. Yeah. I think this is a very good team. Uh, I, I realize they're only 28 and 23 given the injuries they've had. And, and I said this earlier this week with Tim McMahon, at, at least at that point, I still think now they're one of only three teams in the NBA to not have any lineup, not one play more than a hundred minutes together for the season. They've just been a, a mash unit all year, including Kyrie has missed almost half the season <clears throat> and been outstanding when he's played, including boy, did he light up the Brooklyn Nets. This week. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, uh, I think this is a good team. I think they're better on the court right now than they were before this trade deadline. I love the idea of having a rim runner dunker Nat and Gafford is one of the nastiest dunker. He dunks like he wants to embarrass people. I really like, I like guys like that. I want to, I'm dunking like I'm angry at the rim and I want to embarrass who's ever around me. I love the idea of 48 minutes of rim runners um, with Luca and Kyrie, particularly with Luca. It's just awesome. 
don't love the idea of a first round uh, pick for a backup who can't play with my starter, but my starter is young. He's a rookie. He's playing like 20, 25 minutes a game, even when he's healthy. Don't mind it. Uh, don't love it. Don't mind it. The PJ Washington one. Here's, here's my, I, again, they're better. It just feels like they're always chasing their tails a little bit. Yeah. And you look at what they've traded. 20, uh, 2028 pick swap, 2030 pick swap with San Antonio, as you mentioned, yep. to get Grant Williams. So essentially they traded a 2030 pick swap and a top two protected first round pick for PJ Washington. They're already out the 2024 pick for Przingis. Yeah. Uh, still. Yeah. That's going to, that's top 10 per That's going to likely highly likely convey. And they traded another first round pick and Dorian Finney Smith and Spencer Dinwiddie for Kyrie Irving to correct the mistake of letting Jalen Brunson walk in free agency. It just feels like they have paid the Piper pretty heavily to correct mistakes of omission and commission and if you just add it, it looks good on paper. And again, this yeah. team's really good. In just terms of cold asset management, it's a lot out the door. Like that's a lot out the door for the combination of Grant Williams and then, oh, this didn't work. PJ Washington. Credit to them for realizing it wasn't working. I like the Gafford archetype for them. It's just they've kind of been all over the place and given up a lot. And and it's like two steps forward, a step and a half back, two steps forward, a step and a half back it can always net out well because the top guy is that good and is a terror in the playoffs. I just, I'm not as exuberant about their trade deadline as everybody else is. That's yeah, all. Yeah. I mean, well, listen outside of Luca, um, what there hasn't been any stability, right? Like they're there. And I give them credit as far as trying to continually finding the right pieces here, but you can go all the way back from when, when they traded Porzingis for, um, for for uh, for Dinwiddie and that in the, uh, the trade with the Wizards here, I think two or, two or three three years ago maybe, um, and then you look at what they were able to do. Like so, they're continue. So it's like okay, what happens if this doesn't work now? Is it, is PJ going to be the guy next guy next trade? And then we're talking. Is he going to be the guy flipped here? Um, and that you know that that's the challenge here as far as when you have you know we'll have Luca. I had concerns with Dallas when you look at the standings and there have been some nights where, you know, when Ky with Kyrie back and certainly the, you get either two good wins, well, I mean, two wins over Philly and, and Brooklyn. Um, they're, they were sitting in seven and what how you get, maybe the Lakers in the plan. Maybe you lose. Then you, you get the, maybe Utah, maybe you get, maybe you're getting golden state and that, and then you're like basically staring basically at the lottery again. So I, I understand that there. And, I think it'll be interesting how these guys, you know, Lively's got a, a lot. You know, listen, if Derek, uh, if uh, Daniel Gafford's playing more than Derek Lively, that's a problem, right? But Lively has been in and out because he's been injured. Um, but I, all in all, I, I like it for like, I like it for Dallas. Well, Gafford is a good player on a good contract that has two more years left on it after this one, so a year longer than Holmes. He's a solid rim protector. He's a, he's an okay rebounder and a good. He's a good defensive player. He fits well with what they want to do. PJ Washington is going to have to bring it on defense. Yeah. We can sit here and, you know, quibble about what Grant Williams does or doesn't do. He didn't make enough shots, this and that. He's still a good defense player, not a stopper, not quite the stopper Dallas needed him to be, but a better defense player than PJ Washington. Yeah. And we all know this team's going to be incredible on offense when they're healthy. They need to be competent on defense. And I, I get they're probably better defensively because of Gafford. Um, filling those backup five minutes. Be interesting to see what happens to Kaliba and Dwight Powell, the, the, who just is unkillable. He's still on yeah. the Mavs. Um, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens to those guys. But PJ Washington's going to have to bring it defensively. I think Josh Green has been solid, and that's that's meaningful. This is a good team. It's a good yeah. team. It's got to be something more than that pretty damn soon, I think, to justify all the all the sort of asset whatever that has happened to build this team. And the, as you meant, you mentioned Kuzma. I don't like, I don't know what the, pre I, I guess they just couldn't meet Washington. They got pretty far and I think yeah. concluded like we just can't meet Washington's yeah. price. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's probably, um, you know, certainly a walk away number. And as you said, they just couldn't, they couldn't get to where, um, you know, what the wizards were looking for. It strikes me that Tyus Jones didn't get traded. 
You know what? Once Monty Morris goes to Minnesota, that eliminates them. I think, you know, there were teams like Orlando that were kind of sniffing around about him. But I think you look at it from from the uh, Orlando, from the Ma- you know, from the Magic's perspective, um, you know, can we just resign him? Can we sign him as a free agent with room? We could be potentially a room team. But that's another team that, you know, that didn't, you know, that could have maybe added some shooting, perhaps um, that didn't do anything. It's a team that needs guards. Yeah. I agree with you that that was likely their calculation with Tyus Jones. Like, why am I going to expend an asset? Yeah. When I can, when I, they've got uh, how much cap room? I don't know a lot this yeah. coming summer. That's a team. They got, they got a, they should be watching a lot of Hawks games in yeah. the next two months because. If I were them, I would have been tempted to go after DeJounte Murray. And yeah. I remember this, they were hot on Trey Young in the draft. I, I remember in that draft, I, which I believe they took Bamba in that draft. Yep. Um, there was talk about them trying to move up to get Trey Young. And look, I understand like they 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 are winning right now, and they have a team built around these two forwards who have the ball a lot. Introducing Trey Young into that is is totally turning your organization upside down. And I'm not saying anyone is to be clear. I'm not saying anybody considered this on either side of it. I'm just considering it right now because depending on this, this team still stinks on offense still. And it's just an idea that if I were them and I got to the off season, depending on how the rest of the season unfolds, I got to start looking at guards. Like this team's ready to do some stuff and we just don't have the backcourt play and the shooting to really do enough of it. And that's just one direction that I could see them potentially looking. I don't know though. I forgot no. to mention them. They didn't they didn't do anything. No, I mean, listen, they're gonna be, yeah. You know, I think for them, it's almost like, all right, let's see where we are in April. If we're in the plan or if we get to crack the top six, probably in the plan here, and then figure out what we need. You know, they're almost like where I guess where Oklahoma City was a year ago, I wanna say. Uh, probably maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit more advanced. Um you know, with, you know, with certainly with Franz and um, with Paulo there. Um, but yeah, I mean, they'll, they have, I mean, listen, they got all their picks. They got a Denver first and 25. They got a ton of seconds here. Um, they've got a bunch of guys on, you know, uh, team option, expiring, non guaranteed type deals also. I like that they kept Wendell Carter Jr. Um, and not that Deb were ever not going to. All right, Bobby, you need, what, what is the, what is on your docket for the rest of the night? You know what, Zach? I've eaten in the, the ESPN cafe. Probably I've exhausted my options in there, eating turkey burgers and chicken sandwiches and all that fun stuff that I would I would never eat at home, right? Uh, I do not see myself eating at the ESPN cafe tonight. I'm going to find somewhere uh, by myself, tucked away in a corner at some restaurant and, and eat a nice bowl of pasta. And just stare at the wall. Just yeah. stare at the wall thinking about Najee Marshall didn't get traded. Now just started mumbling Najee Mar. Why is that guy over there and mumbling Najee <laughs> between bites of pasta? All right, Bobby Marks, it's time to call Kevin Pelton in from the bullpen. You got to go eat your pasta. Thank you, as always, for what has become an annual tradition of a groggy, bristol fied Bobby Marks and I doing a podcast about the trade deadline. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Zach. All right. We should probably play Enter Sandman here because coming out of the bullpen – Ready to close it. You can get nine outs if necessary. I, that's probably a bad reference for a Mariners fan. I'm sorry, Kevin Pelton. How are you? Yeah, the uh, especially the 90s era bullpens were, were not a strength for the Mariners. You were not excited when that music started. What year was it that you, the Mariners won like a million games and then predictably lost to the Yankees in the playoffs, to, much to my chagrin? It, it was 2001 when they tied the all-time record with 116 wins before losing to the Yankees. Although, admittedly, that was uh, after the the peak of my Mariners fandom in the late 90s. Griffey? Griffey was Gr- Griffey was the apex? For sure. Oh, has there ever been a more fun baseball player until Julio Rodriguez? I don't, I don't know, and I don't know who that person is that you just said their name. Um, okay, uh, we, Bobby and I talked about tons of stuff. Uh, I want to talk to you about a trade that I think is a, a series of trades that I think is going to go under the radar a little bit. Um, Raptors Jazz made a very interesting and somewhat unexpected to me trade. 
um, where the Raptors acquired Kelly Olynyk and Ochai Abaji for salary filler of Otto Porter and Kyra Lewis and a 2024 first round pick that's going to be the lesser of a lot of picks. So it'll be a low first round pick. And I saw an initial reaction was like, what is what is Toronto doing? They're trading a first round pick for an expiring contract in Kelly Olynyk and kind of a project wing who's 23 already in Agbaji. Um, a little surprised that Utah uh, traded three of its 10 rotation players, if you include Fontecchio, to Detroit. Um, who did who did take take it from the Raptors' perspective? What did you think of this trade? It's an interesting yeah, I mean, one. I mean, I had the same reaction in terms of Olinick being part of this deal. Like the first question is 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 he going to go somewhere else? Are they going to get value for him somehow in a, a separate deal here? But uh, you know, it seems like based on the reporting that they just really liked Olinick and. In case they decide to keep Bruce Brown Jr. on his $22 million team option and stay over the cap, this is a case of pre-agency where you're getting the the players' bird rights in order to be able to re-sign them. Uh, it wasn't where I was expecting Olenek to go. I, I don't even know if I was even expecting him to get traded by the Jazz, you know, given that they're very much in the thick of the play in conversation. Uh, and it's an interesting set of moves that we'll talk about from their standpoint. But yeah, I mean, I think... It's a late first in a draft that no one is all that excited about. You're getting a guy who was a higher first round pick a year ago in Abaji. Uh, I think a lot of his value has diminished this season. He hasn't shot the ball particularly well. I, I've never been huge on Abaji. He didn't come out super well in my draft projections. So I'm not terribly surprised, but like he doesn't ago, he doesn't really dribble, which which is a weak which is a thing that matters. Um you better shoot and play defense at like A to A plus levels if that's going to be the case. And, he, and look, he's young; he hasn't done either of those things. But I think it's worth. I think that's worth a shot. Right. I, anyway, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, like if you would have a year ago said, "Hey, you're trading a late first round pick for Ochai Abaji on his own," I think people would have seen that as a pretty reasonable deal, given that Abaji played pretty well the back half of his rookie season after, you know, he got more of an opportunity when Utah sold off at last year's deadline. This year, his value is not quite as high, but still a first round pick in a late draft to get that plus a Linux bird rights. I mean, I understand it. I don't, I don't think it's a move I necessarily would have made, but it's not unreasonable. I think I actually like it better for Toronto than I do for Utah. And that's not to say I don't, I don't like it for Utah because I said three days ago, if they get offered a, a bad first, a late first for Kelly Olenek, I think they have to do that. And they did that. They just threw Agbaji in too. Um, so they they paid a little bit more than I thought for the same equivalent pick. I think Agbaji is fine to take a look at. The Raptors already have, what, three picks in this coming draft. So I think they were like, we don't need all these picks. And I think Olenek is just is good. And having a shooting big man and a playmaking big man is just a handy thing to have around for a young team that needs both of those things, frankly. And I think he can play with Pirtle, too. I mean, he's shown in Utah he can kind of be a little malleable positionally. Um, I, I kind of and, – and I don't think, like, a lot of these centers, like, yeah, he's expiring. I don't think, like, there's going to be a huge, like, bidding war for Kelly Olenek. I think if the Raptors want to re-sign him and operate as an over-the-cap team, like keeping Bruce Brown, whatever, like, I don't think they're going to end up, like, paying him an amount that is going to hamstring them. I kind of like it. Utah's perspective, it's an interesting trade deadline for Utah. Let's like take their two deals in tandem. <clears throat> Out go Fon Fon Simone Fontecchio, Kelly Olenek, and Ochai Baji. Fontecchio is the starter and like the only wing, true wing almost on the whole team. I guess Ogbaji is, but he he's the 10th guy and sometimes his minutes get squeezed. Those are three of the 10 guys that were playing for them. In come the 2024 first that we talked about, which is a, a, who is it? Oklahoma City. It's Oklahoma City or the Clippers, right? So it's going to be a bad first. So I believe it is the the. Now I've lost track of which one it is. I think it's the worst of all of these, or it's the second. Yeah, it's the worst of all of these because Indiana had that, then went to Toronto in the Siakam deal, and now coming here. It's very confusing because now the second worst of those got traded and ended up in Dallas. Anyway, so Fontecchio, Olenek, Agbaji out in this 25-plus first-round pick. The Wizards' second-round pick, which would be a good pick. This, this Proceda prospect who people seem to like who's in Europe, and I may be mispronouncing his name because I, I've never seen him play. Um, and the, obviously, they've opened up minutes for Taylor Hendricks. will be interesting. They were never interested in Bruce Brown. That was, not, that was never a thing. Um, so three rotation players out. 
a first round pick, a second round pick, and a prospect in. What do we think of that in in total, both for this season's team? Because I, I I think that Utah should want to make the play in, and I think their moves as a whole are a boon for Golden State and Houston and the Lakers, because I think Utah is demonstrably worse on the floor, which makes me a little sad because I want them to go for it. So what do you think of their team now and going forward? Yeah, I think they're considerably worse. I mean, it's not probably as big a drop off as last year when, you know, they traded Mike Conley and and didn't really have anything at point guard and also just kind of sat all their guys down the stretch. And it'll be interesting also in the context of the, you know, the other pick involved in this Oklahoma City four first round picks this year that have been traded all over the place is Utah's top 10 protected. Something we talked about back in the preseason, we were talking about the Jazz over under and how that would motivate them. And for a long period of time, it seemed like, okay, it's not even going to be a concern. They're not going to be all that close to that. Now, all of a sudden, there's a chance, I think, they drop down into that that bottom 10 in the league and, and have a chance to keep it this year. Now, whether, you know, there's a lot of talk about, do they want to get that obligation over with, especially in a draft that everyone considers so weak and not have to worry about in 2025? But these moves seem to indicate you're probably going down into that bottom 10 the rest of this year. They got to start losing pretty fast. That bottom 10 is 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 robust, um, but they, they can do it. I mean, they showed last year that they can do it. It's totally doable. Uh, we'll see how the East shakes out from eight to eight to 12. Um, let's see. Are there any other thoughts on the Raptors? Well, Raptors uh, perspective? The, well, from the jazz, I, I think the other thing I'd say is one of the strategies I thought they might take is kind of a mixed strategy. You know, so much of this focus is on well, which teams are going to add and which teams are going to subtract. And like, it, it doesn't always have to be one or the other. Toronto now is an example of that. They're a team that has subtracted with Pascal Siakam and, and OG Ananobi and then added. Well, and by the way, LA one of the, the the first round pick they traded in this deal is one of the three they received from Indiana in the Siakam deal. So you can kind of wrap all those together. Correct. And they've also got the protected pick issue where they do not seem to be worrying about the top six protection on the pick that they have sent to San Antonio. So they then would probably end up with only one first round pick from Indiana in this year's draft if they if they lose their own and, and after trading this one. But, you know, I thought that maybe it'd be a case where like if we get a lot of value for a Linux or we get a lot of value for Jordan Clarkson, let's make those moves. But maybe we backfill them and pick up someone younger. So Manu Fintecchio actually was that kind of someone younger on that timeline. And instead, he was the guy they traded to Detroit. So, you know, I think I wrote about this last year when the Jazz made the Westbrook trade and gave up on Conley and gave up on that play in chase. Uh, Sam Hinkie was famously the guy with the longest room in the view in the room. Danny Ainge, despite not being considered Hinkie ish, uh, is a GM or, you know, and his executive uh, CEO of basketball operations or whatever his title is now. He has operated with a really long view throughout this time in Utah. And I think these trades are consistent with that, where, you know, the fact that uh, the the chance to make the play in this year is not that important. Even the ability to re-sign Fontecchio as a restricted free agent, not that important to them. And it's all about, we're just going to keep trying to create value wherever we can. And, you know, I actually, as much as I want them to make the play and I think they're worse, it's hard to argue with the value plays. Like, Fontecchio is fine. If you didn't think you were going to re-sign him to get the wizard second round pick for him is great, is great value, I think. Um, if you've concluded Ogbaji just isn't going to happen and you've got Keonti George and you like Sexton and you like Clarkson, maybe there just aren't going to be minutes for him and it's a sunk cost and you go with it. It really comes down to Olinick, and they did get a first. And so like they they got more stuff to trade, more stuff to do. Just this season, I'm even curious like how they fill these minutes, particularly the Fontecchio minutes, because if you're going to play Markinen now at the three more that he's going to have to play with Kessler and Collins some, and like that, that may screw up your spacing a little bit. I'm just interested to see how they fill this all. Maybe Hendricks is the solution to this, to some of that problem. And I've liked what I've seen from him. You, it, I actually think that both teams did fine from a value perspective. It, it struck me as strange both, both ways first, but I, I kind of like it for both. Yeah, I think it's just unexpected more than it is necessarily bad for for either of these teams' perspectives. Uh, yeah, I mean, Hendricks, I think, hypothetically, is a bit of a solution to that. If the idea is that, you know, Kessler and Collins can't play together because they're both rim runners, Hendricks is notionally a stretch forward, does provide you a little something different. I like it. Let's see it. 
Um, what did you think of the Warriors uh, doing nothing other than trading Corey Joseph? I was okay with it. I mean, I, I just, you know, a few weeks ago had begun to feel like I don't know if Steph Curry is still playing at the level where we should be sacrificing a lot in pursuit of this season. Uh, you know, as it, Woj has explained recently, it seems like they're thinking is, look, the most important thing that we can do to get back to that, uh, playing at a high level is to get Andrew Wiggins and Clay Thompson to where they were in the 2021 title run. And, you know, I think there's a better chance of that with Wiggins, given his age, than there is with with Clay. But, you know, I think that's realistic. And then the other thing is, you know, Kaminga playing so well, you don't want to part with him. I, I'm still very high in Moses Moody, although he's had a tough time carving out playing time uh, just because of the fact that Brandon Jemski has jumped him in the pecking order of young prospects with the Warriors. But I I wouldn't have have given up any of those young prospects. I wouldn't have wanted to give away draft picks in pursuit of this season. It would have to be something that really made me clearly better this season and next season to do that. I mean, the Chris Paul question is the one that's still hanging out there. In terms of what why didn't they... That? What they do with that salary. I mean, I, I think these presumption is the reason they didn't trade him is because they're going to cut their payroll next year by by taking advantage of that non-guarantee in his contract. But, you know, still, they've still got several months to figure that out. This was always the obvious, not problem, but just reality baked into the two timelines thing is even if some of these guys hit and Kaminga's hit, hitting, Pajemsi's, Pajemsi's good, Obviously, the Wiseman thing was a miss, a very costly one. You know, we'll see on Moody. Even if they hit, they might hit on such a timeline that it's too late for Steph Curry. And even if that hit is starting to happen now, it's only starting to happen. And it's happening while Clay Thompson declines and Andrew Wiggins is doing whatever. And altogether, it makes you just sort of go back and think about the hypothetical of like, what could they have gotten? Had they just traded the number two pick in the draft before it became James Wiseman, what could they have gotten for these people? Um, they didn't do that. And I think I, I think their team is kind of coming together in an interesting way with the Draymond at the five starting lineup and Kaminga, Draymond, and Wiggins are playing well together. Uh Pajemski's just legit good. Um is is Kaminga the second best player on the team? Yeah, over the last month without question. Yeah. That came that came fast. And it it just might be like so they're in the process of reshaping it. Um, it just it just may be too late, and that's okay for now. Like I didn't really have a, I it, it and the flip side is I think there are some teams around the league who had chances to acquire Jonathan Kaminga in trades, particularly like last year. I think Toronto could have gotten Kaminga in in like if you know Ananobi was in play, Siakam was in play, and they didn't. You know they studied Kaminga extensively, and he was in the same draft in the same range as Scotty Barnes. So they know, and and I, but they're not alone. I think a lot of teams could have tried to get Kaminga, and and now it's too late. He's he's just legit good. What did you think of um, what do you what do you make of the report? It's interesting, you know, a, a name that was talked about a lot and ultimately didn't get traded, and I didn't expect him to, was Jalen Green, and there were also reports that the Nets, or the Rockets, offered the Nets the ability to get all their picks and all their swaps back from the Harden deal in exchange for Mikhail Bridges. I'm not sure where Jalen Green fit into that. Um, what did you make of all that noise and the Nets just saying, eh, we're good? It, it's a fascinating scenario because I do think teams especially value those that ability to get their own picks back because now it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of your strategy. You know, I don't buy this idea that the Nets can't tank because of the fact that they owe these picks to Houston because – Guess what? We we just saw Brooklyn go through an extended rebuild without its own draft picks when Sean so we just we just saw them there. do it. So so they definitely very much can. Now it may not make as much sense for them to do it, especially if they feel like they can be more competitive than they've been this season. And you know the the brief flashes we've seen from Ben Simmons the last few games here have been kind of exciting, although it's it's hard oh, to no put no too much no into that. no. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna reality Tony Reality mute you until he makes more than one free throw in a month. I don't fair. care. But that's that's completely. He fair plays ho- once he gets past half court. He plays horizontally. He's now playing sideline to side. I don't know how many times he's touched the paint with a live dribble in any of the games he's come back. I do wonder if there's an element where, and you know, he was much more aggressive. I think during the preseason when we saw him play, 
when teams aren't as used to Ben Simmons not looking for his own shot and thinking about that, maybe he can be more effective in those situations than when they start realizing, hey, we need to play him for the pass anytime he drives here. So I yeah, so from that standpoint, you know, it, it would have been really interesting for Brooklyn. And I think, I mean, that would have been amazing value clearly for Mikhail Bridges. And like, if you go back to the Durant trade, somehow you would have gotten all of your own picks plus all of Phoenix's picks. I mean, that would have been a, a remarkable haul. That's part of why Brooklyn did so well when I regretted the, uh, the Durant trade earlier this week. But I can also understand why, look, we've, We've gone through all this pain. We've got a guy who's played quite well for us in Mikhail Bridges, uh, even if it's not necessarily leading to a lot of team success. He's also the kind of guy that players want to play with. So if you're trying to eventually recruit via free agency after Simmons' contract expires and you have some more cap flexibility, Bridges is a guy you probably still want in your roster at that point. Yeah, time will tell. Um Time will tell. I, I've had a number of front office executives say, man, if they really were offered their picks back, they probably should have done that. And, I, and my response is the same as yours. Like, yeah, in the cold reality of spreadsheet basketball, probably um, in this reality, it's it's a little tougher. Uh, they didn't trade Dorian Finney-Smith um, and uh, they didn't trade Nick Claxton. I don't think they were ever going to. I actually think they would like to re-sign Nick Claxton, uh, who's good. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to open the floor to you. Pick, pick a team or a deal that was in, or a non-deal or whatever that was curious or interesting or that you just want to talk about Kevin Pelton. Well, I'm curious. I obviously didn't get a chance to hear Bobby's appearance on the front half of this podcast is, is the starting pitcher. Uh, I saw and, and have not had a chance to read this because I've had my head down righty all day that he has Dallas as a winner of the trade deadline. And that's interesting because I think particularly from a long-term perspective, I find them a loser in terms of, you know, now they have given up control of, all their possible drafts starting in 2027, uh, which is the year after Luka Doncic can hit free agency. And look, that's one thing if it's a Milwaukee Bucks situation and it's we're willing to trade all these picks for Drew Holiday the first time and then Damian Lillard the second time because we know that that's going to convince Giannis and Edekumpo to sign an extension with us. He's going to be with us through this run. These aren't going to be very good draft picks. Dallas isn't in that position yet with Luka Doncic and he may stick around, you know, they're going to have at some point the supermax to be able to present to him, but boy, are you taking an enormous risk that if Luka ends up on another roster by that point, you are rebuilding without any kind of a net whatsoever. And I just don't think like, it's one thing to do that because of the fact that again, you're getting a guy like Drew Holiday or Damian Lillard, star players who are going to make you a championship contender, be the difference in winning a championship in Milwaukee's case with Holiday. P.J. Washington is not, to me, that guy. I was a little closer to you than to Bobby uh, on the Mavericks. I, I think I use the phrase chasing their tail a lot on a lot of these, like, throw 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 more picks at problems, which is which is fine. They've just made, A, they know Luka better than we do, and B, they may conclude that as long as we have Luka and Kyrie, we're not as far as the record would suggest we are from being in that top tier conversation i do think they're better today on the court than they were yesterday but i have the same um the same kind of concerns you do it's a, it's a lot uh to give up and i'm not sure defensively you know the gafford thing will help uh mm -hmm. the the back line defense but it'll be interesting to see if they can really get a boost um defensively you mentioned milwaukee <clears throat> what do you think of milwaukee right now uh I think I, I, they're fascinating first off because, you know, the whole idea when Adrian Griffin came in was, well, why is he doing all these, these, you know, wild trapping and pressure and, you know, Brooke Lopez is up on at the level of the screen. Like we know the drop coverage with Brooke Lopez works and they went back to that pretty quickly. And now here comes Doc Rivers replacing Adrian Griffin. And all of a sudden they're trapping all over the place. You know, Brooke Lopez has not necessarily been on the court for all of this, uh, you know, uh, the other night he was out due to personal reasons and the the comeback they had. I, I can't remember how involved he was against Dallas, but it it is fascinating to see teams keep the coaches keep doing this with Milwaukee to try to do the thing that they haven't been good at, but you know, maybe to their detriment. And I would what I would say is what we have seen the last few games that's maybe different from early in the season is, you know, besides the low-hanging fruit of transition defense, it's also like 
Now they're actually forcing turnovers, particularly against Luca when they were trapping him. It's one thing to trap and not force turnovers. Like that's that's definitely a, a worse defense than the drop coverage. If you can force a lot of turnovers, it can be a better defensive style. What do you think of Pat Beverly there? Remember, remember the clip of Pat Beverly and, and Marcus Morris jumping all over themselves, laughing at Damian Lillard missing free throws in the bubble? Uh, it definitely appeared on Twitter. I mean, I also remember uh, Pat, Patrick Beverly getting prickly, pretty quickly excised by the Clippers after they had it, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George because of the conflict between those two styles. And, you know, it's it's fascinating given that uh, Doc Rivers was still overseeing that last season of it. So that that's a tie as well. I, I think he is an upgrade for them. I, I never really quite got when people thought that Cameron Payne was a, a big pickup for their depth. Uh, after the Lillard trade, he just wasn't that effective last season, which is why, you know, Phoenix and San Antonio, two teams that both needed point guards, chose to move on from him this offseason. So I, I do think it helps them. And and I, I'm i probably higher on Patrick Beverly than, you know, even a lot of people in the analytics community, our buddy Seth Part now. I, I do think what he does defensively is more than just show. I think it translates to better defense and that. You know, the other aspect of it is just having somebody giving that kind of visible effort will be a nice thing on this Milwaukee team where that defensive effort has not been as strong this season as in past years. And he does guard up pretty well. Um, He just he, like you, we've seen him guard Durant and he gets into his stomach and his chest and is annoying. So I, I could see him closing games over Malik Beasley, maybe if they need defense. I, I'm not sure about Middleton. I think he's too important to their team. And and that'll hurt their offense a little bit, but I, you, you everything is is a trade off. Um, you just I mean their perimeter defense is so bad, and like I was watching their game against Utah the other day when Utah outscored them by twenty seven points in the fourth quarter. I mean they were like double teaming Jordan Clarkson at the elbow because they knew that he's going to blow by Malik Beasley, he's going to blow by Damian Lillard, he's going to break our defense, and they were like oh, Jordan Clarkson's like oh this is this is what you're doing, this is easy, I'll just throw pass after pass, after pass, and we'll rain threes on you. And so I I think given what they had, it is <clears throat> a pretty good move. They just, you know, they fired their coach. They did their little dance, the little conga line that they did, did that night, and they're one and four since. Their defense doesn't really show many signs of improving. And, you know, they they need to start clicking a little bit. Like the playoffs are not that far away, and we just haven't seen a version of this team yet that gives you a ton of faith that they have a really long run in them. I think as long as they have Dame and Giannis, they have a, an upside of championship. Like they can make a really long run. But I'm starting to get the point where it's like I kind of would like to see like demonstrable three straight weeks of just like oh this team's really good right now. Absolutely. I mean, look. You know, they have had a lot of change this season, but we're more than halfway into the season. You know, they, they've had a lot of runway. Chris Middleton has been in the lineup more regularly. Like, you know, the the excuses that have been out there, those kind of got used up, which is why I think they decided to make the coaching change when they did. And now they've got kind of this new explanation of we're trying new things under Doc Rivers. But you just, this is the this is the danger uh, of making a coaching change mid-season is you just don't have that much time. Were you as high on the Knicks and what they did today as everybody else? I haven't gotten a chance to read. All. Oh, no, I did. You gave them an A. You gave the Knicks an A. Absolutely. They were atop my list of winners from today. I mean, you know, the I think the biggest question is once OG Ananobi comes back from this uh, surgery that he's undergoing and Julius Randle is back, like, can they find enough minutes to keep Boyan Bogdanovich happy? Because that they're that deep. Like, that's... That's pretty incredible given that they've also kind of upgraded in terms of high-end talent within this season by making the Ananobi trade. I I think there's a lot to like. And then, you know, down the road, the fact that they've still retained all their first-round picks, they've got uh, Bogdanovich's non-guarantee next year that they'll surely guarantee is matching salary in a trade if, if a star comes available. I, I think they've done tremendously well. You go back over like the, you think about the last, I guess, going back to the 2022 off season when they signed Brunson and the guy, the quality of talent that they've added in that span Brunson at the off season, hard at last year's trade deadline, Dante DiVincenzo this off season, who, you know, think about all the teams that could have offered Dante DiVincenzo their non-taxpayer mid-level exception and how much better he would be for them. I mean, obviously, you know, Gabe Vincent, unfortunately, we haven't even got a chance to see with the Lakers because of his injury. But imagine Dante DiVincenzo with the Lakers, the way that he's shooting it right now. 
and then Ananobi, Bogdanovich, and Burks so far this season. I mean, that's that's an incredible run of talent accumulation to go with, you know, starting with the fact that they developed, you know, a lot of these later draft picks quickly and Grimes into players who had a lot of trade value. Well, yeah, if you look back, it I said with Bobby, it almost happened in such like a drip, drip, drip pattern that you almost didn't notice it. If you go back and look at like in 2018, 19, they won 17 games. In 2019, 20, they were 21 and 45. That was Randall. Randall was on that team uh, already. And then they hired Tibbs and they won 20 more games the next season. Um, it's not like they were even starting from a position of strength. It's not like they tanked and got a foundational player and kind of built everything off of that. They were starting, if anything, from a position of like, we got Barrett, who's fine, but was the consolation prize in that draft behind Zion and Morant. And like a lot of draft misses behind that. Like they had the Kevin Knox miss, the Nilakina miss, like all of these things linger and set them back in terms of what their asset base was. And just like... I went back and I looked earlier today when I had 10 minutes of like roster by roster, transaction by transaction. Cause I, my brain was like, wait a second, how did they, let me review. How did they get like step by step? How did they do it? And it's actually pretty amazing when you just lay it all out. It's like one little thing after another, after another, after another, it's, it's very interesting. One of my philosophies on trading is that people think trading in the NBA is like one red paper clip where it's just like, I'm going to tra trade from you know this thing that isn't worth very much to a star player. And that it's generally not like that. It's more about like, I have this piece that I you need, you have this piece that I need, and we make a trade and it, it works well for both of us. But the Knicks have sort of one red paper clipped uh, a lot of things over the past two and a half years here. Before we go, uh, just give me uh, your quick thoughts on the Lakers standing pat and not trading for DeJounte Murray and the Hawks not trading for DeJounte Murray. Hit this with a little with Bobby a little bit, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think from Atlanta's perspective, it makes sense to me, even though I would I would love to see DeJounte Murray somewhere else. I, I wrote in my winners and losers about he's performed at an all-star level when Trey Young has been off the court this season. And it's been, you know, usually him and Bogdanovich in the backcourt. And he he's just been cooking in the pick and roll in those situations. Uh, but you know, I think when you look at the Lakers, I understand the decision not to make a move now. I don't think that there was one move that was going to be good enough to get them into the top four in the West because of the fact that, you know, that's just such a higher bar than it was last year when the path really opened up for them out of the play-in tournament in a way that I don't think it will this year with, you know, the Clippers and Nuggets as teams that project as very strong playoff teams. And, you know, people are going to be more skeptical of Minnesota and Oklahoma City because of their lack of experience. But I don't think that, you know, those teams are going to be easy, easy fodder if you match up with them in a first round series no whatsoever. Way. No way. So, no way. So given all that, I totally understand not throwing kind of bad money after good or good money after bad, I guess is the expression. I don't know, uh, money after money. Uh, by making, give you away one of your rare draft picks right now. And then now you will have the three draft picks come draft night that you can put into a trade. Now, the downside of that is, as I wrote about in the winners and losers, you also have LeBron by draft night, two days away from a player option decision. And there's going to be a lot of looming pressure, especially if the playoffs do not go well this year on, we have to do something, make a move now to upgrade dramatically. And uh, you know who would be, I'd be pretty excited about being the Atlanta Hawks on draft night, if that's really the situation, because all of a sudden, maybe I'm able to leverage even more out of the Lakers than I was asking for now. And the Lakers are not projected to be a second Amperin team next year, correct? Not even, I don't think even close. Yeah, I mean they're they're not they're not all that close to that right now, and I don't yeah. think their payroll goes up dramatically. So they'll year. have flexibility to do to do what they want. Um, interesting thoughts, Kevin Pelton. You probably have more writing to do. I have some writing to do. My brain is mush, and I'm hungry, and I'm going to eat. And uh, waiting in my fridge is a big 24 ounce <laughs> single beer that I will be drinking in several hours and just luxuriating in. I can't wait. Uh, it's a wonderful annual tradition, and I look forward. We'll, we'll have you back on soon because now we get to see how all these things start. The next couple of nights of NBA basketball are, are not awesome, but after that, we start to see new players and new places. We'll break it all down. Kevin Pelton, go read. We got trade grades. We got winners and losers. The machine is up and running. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. 